Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we contemplate this final text in the 12th chapter of Luke, which is a magnificent chapter on a discourse that is one directed to the disciples and now in the text today to the crowds, but really has the Pharisees as the object of Jesus' words. And as, a, as you know, I've been doing these sermon series uh, suggestions in my podcast, and I, I would like to suggest that this is the final um, passage of a, a series of texts that have to do, and these are all from Luke 12, that have to do with this very important intersection between persecution, possessions, and hypocrisy. And just to be very brief, one of the things that is in chapter 12, and, and this is where there's a little bit of a shift in, in, um, in focus here, um, because you're going to see that Jesus is, is really directing it in a way that is unlike anything he's done before in this particular chapter. And then I'm going to study with you, I'm going to add 54 to 56, because I really think they go together. And, and here he's essentially talking to his disciples, but then it's going to say here now that he shifts his focus to the crowds. And that's an interesting shift, you know, and you'll see why. But anyway, the, the, the whole chapter starts with, with fear and the, the you know, apostasy, uh, the unforgivable sin is what's in play there, sinning against the Holy Spirit. And for Luke, sinning against the Holy Spirit means everybody who rejects Jesus before the cross. After Pentecost, we're really talking about people who reject Jesus are essentially unbelievers. It's not that, I don't think it's that complicated in Luke. It's very simple. Everybody really is, in a sense, sinning against Jesus up until Pentecost because of the cross, even after the resurrection to a certain extent. But certainly the cross is and resurrection are, are the turning points. But after Pentecost, the people who re reject Jesus are really sinning against the Holy Spirit. They're unbelievers. But what it's about, really, is fear of confessing the true faith. And that's what makes people hypocrites. Because they're fear, fearing of being persecuted. And so they create this facade to stand behind. And they use their possessions to stand beside that behind that facade. Now, if you, look, if you look at the text that you've been doing the last two weeks, you did The Rich Fool, which certainly focuses in on particularly possessions, but, I mean, in a way, you see he's the ultimate hypocrite. And by the way, it, the word hypocrite is used in the first 12 verses. You're going to see it's going to occur in this text, too, here. So there's a nice frame there of starting with hypocrites and ending with hypocrites. And then in 22, excuse me, 12, 22 to 34, you have the, the passage on, on not being anxious, you know. And this has to do with possessions, too. This is one of the three chapters in Luke where possessions are the focus, and it, very much the focus, 12, chapter 12, verses chapter 16 and, and chapter 18. Um, 35 to 40 is... A possibility. I don't know who did that podcast, but they might have included that there. But then we jump ahead to this text here. We skip over what is really a, an, a, an important text about being stewards of the mysteries because it's used in another series. That's why we don't do it here in Luke. But we have this really, I think, vital text that talks to us about these parallels. And, and th this has been a mystery to, to many. Um, I encourage you to read, if you have my commentary, The Excursus on Baptism, where I deal with this text because of the language of baptism here. But look at, I, I put this in English and then we'll look at the Greek, but fire and baptism are paralleled. I came, I have to throw, to be baptized with. You know, and how am I in distress until it is accomplished? So you can see the fire and baptism, these are all paralleled. And then, do you suppose that I brought peace? Peace, fire, baptism, peace, I have come to give to the earth. So 
you, you have these three things here. Fire, baptism, and peace. And it's, notice it's in the earth. Now, let's, let's just look at it at the, in the Greek, because I think it'll, it'll be easier for us to kind of see what Jesus is doing here. Um, fire, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, um, when did Jesus cast fire on the earth? And, and this takes us back to 3.16 where John the Baptist said, I baptize you with the water, but he who is coming after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now I spent a lot of time thinking about where does Jesus baptize with the Holy Spirit and where does he baptize with fire? And I think, you know, the, sort of the final answer is that that's what happens at Pentecost. But before we get to Pentecost, I think the reference here to the Holy Spirit is the baptism in the Jordan. And the reference to fire is the reference here in 12, 49, and 50. And I think here is the key to interpreting this text. The fire here, of course, is the fire of God's wrath against sin. And Jesus and, and, you know, you got to take this carefully. Jesus casts fire on the earth by being the focus of God's wrath against sin. So what we're talking about here is how the wrath of God against sin is kindled against Jesus on the cross. And that is where he is, in a sense, killed because the wrath of God kills him. And so the, the fire that destroys, so to speak, this is a, a destroying fire, not a, not a purifying fire, but this is a destroying fire, and it kills him. And the, these are parallel. The, this is like that, that, that Hebrew, you know, uh, sin, uh, the, the Hebrew parallelisms. You know, fire baptism. This is a baptism in blood. So if this is a baptism in water here in the Jordan, this baptism is the baptism on the cross in blood. I call it his bloody bath. And Jesus says, a baptism I have to be baptized with and how I am consumed, soon echo, it's consumed me until it has reached its goal. And in both of these, these verses, he is talking about how the wrath of God destroys Jesus, kills him, and causes him to be baptized in his own blood. Now, here's the irony. This act brings peace with God. But Jesus is very clear here, and this is, this is the nature of his teaching on discipleship in Luke. When you enter into this world, when, when this happens, those who are attached to Jesus, they will not have peace in this world, but they will have division. You know, and look at how many times division is used. And it sets families against one another. Now what is so interesting to me about this is that this comes out of the, the nature of Jesus' kinship laws. And his kinship laws are such that for the Jews, the kinship laws were by blood. You know, genealogies. All the genealogies that you see. You know, and, and I mean, we could go on and on about this, but Genesis genealogies are fulfilled in the gene genealogy in Luke 3. You know, that ends son of Adam, son of God. They're the two persons of Jesus. And by blood, by your genealogy, that would make you a child of God as a member of Israel. Now what Jesus comes along and does is he blows this whole thing up. He says, this no longer exists. Okay? The family of God is not by blood, is not by genealogy, it's by faith. 
So that's why even within families, father and son, son and father, mother and daughter, etc., th this relationship, which is so near and dear to the Jews, this, because of faith, can create division. You know, and therefore, not the kind of peace that the world gives. So, I mean, you, you can certainly preach the whole, the whole, you know, the whole sermon on this text alone. And, and in, in, in many ways, this is the, the main text. As you know, the other part is in parentheses. I do want to talk about it, though, because I, I, I love this text because of, of, of what it says about what's happening here. Um, What, well, I'll just roll it down. But what it says here uh, about the, the nature of how it is we are to be able to discern who Jesus is. Uh, the, what I, if, you, if you read the commentary, I, I, I'm calling this a hermeneutical text. And Jesus does you know, what a good rabbi does. He uses some common human examples. And I think it's very important to notice now that he's addressing the crowds. Before he was addressing disciples, there's one outburst by one guy in the middle of it, but it's really dressed, it's kind of the inside baseball. But now this is for everyone. And he says it very simply, you know, and, and it, it's, it's important to recognize that when, when, he, when he says this text, everybody knows what he's talking about. Namely, that they are able to discern the signs in nature. So when you see a cloud rising in the west, you know that it's going to rain. You know, you know it's going to rain. You know, I'm in Fort Wayne. When I see those particular kind of clouds coming, you can just feel it. You know that it's going to be a thunderstorm. You know you might get tornado watches. I mean, there's, it's not hard. You can feel the temperature drop. The wind has that eerie sound. You know, and he uses another one, the south wind, when the south wind is blowing, you know. Um, you know it's going to be hot, the, the, the heat is coming. Um, I do a lot of mission work in Spain, and we watch the weather, and if the weather, the, the, the patterns are such that the winds are coming up out of Africa, we know we're going to be, you know, immersed in this incredible heat wave. So you, you can read, I mean, what he's saying to them is you can read the signs of nature. And now he comes back to that word hypocrite. Now remember, this comes from fear. It comes from fear of confessing Jesus. I, I, I encourage you to read that first part of Luke 12 because this is what it's about. You know, when Jesus is there and you see and you're about to confess him, don't be a hypocrite. Don't stand behind a facade. Don't be afraid of being persecuted for confessing the true faith. You know, and... And that's why, you know, he says you can discern. That's the word used in 1 Corinthians 11 for discerning, you know, the body of Christ. You know, you can discern these things on the earth and the heaven. And here's the big word. I'll use another color here. I mean, here's the big word, the kairos. When the kairos is coming, why are you not able to know it by discernment, you know? I mean, that is the critical. How do you know not to examine this critical time. And that critical time is the coming of Christ and his teachings and his miracles and his person that he is the Christ. How can, how can you miss this? Now, the next passage, it would be fun to see if anybody chooses to, to, to uh, preach on this because it's a little difficult. But it's, it's really not, okay? Here's what you got to think about when you're thinking about this. This is about life as a pilgrimage. And it's a pilgrimage to the judge, to judgment. And along the way, as you're walking, there are going to be signs of the presence of the adversary, the anti diku You know, on the way. See that? On the way. On the pilgrimage. That's pilgrimage language. 
Now the key here is to see that the adversary is Jesus. And you are going to come across through his teachings, through his presence in the world, through the church, you're going to see his teachings. And are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready when the time of judgment comes? Now, this is, this is, a, this is a hard saying. This is a very hard saying. And at the end of this discourse, this ends with a strong note of the law, which is why, you know, if you do preach on this text, you somehow have to circle back to the fire and to baptism and to the atonement and realize that this is that adversary that you must come to terms with and, and the way you come to terms with it is by taking the journey in faith and by faithfully using the means that are given you on the journey to stay faithful, to see that Jesus is the one who is baptized in his own blood. So what a, what a wonderful, in a sense, way of recognizing that here now, as we really begin a, a new kind of section, that the next section begins with the second travel notice, 1322, where Jesus for the second time now is making his way to Jerusalem. You can really see now that we're coming to an end. This is a, the end of a section of Luke. And um, I pray that, that, that your sermon will give them a sense that every time they come into the presence of God in the, in the church, this is the moment of Kairos. And do they discern that Jesus is there for them? That they are receiving the fruits of his bloody bath on the cross. And that by receiving them, they are not hypocrites, but ones who embrace and confess the true faith by confessing Jesus.